two people in here. This kind of um, starts like a select board meeting, and we have to call it to order because anytime the select board meet, it has to be recorded, and we have to follow certain rules. So the first thing is to uh, uh, call the meeting to order, which I just did, and adopt our agenda. Do I have a motion on the agenda? I make a motion that we adopt the agenda as written. Second. Anyone? Second. Second. Okay, for changes, item three on the original agenda was to award the bids for demolition, and that's been removed to our next meeting next Monday night. So item three is gone. So it is all um, about the um, working on the budget. Um, any other changes to the agenda from anyone? None heard. All in favor of the agenda, approving the agenda, please say aye. 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 That is a select board. Just so you all know, sorry about that. Um, now we're moving on to what would be select board remarks. I would just like to start with my uh, uh, dissertation that this is a workshop that we can um, have open dialogue and discuss ideas, um, which tonight's topic is the police department first. And when we're done that, we will move into town management. Um, the idea, it is to share ideas. Um, no discussion and no idea is considered stupid, so please don't be afraid to mention anything that you want to talk about. Uh, initially, I'm going to hold a conversation of each point up here at the table, and then we will take public remarks out, out there so the public is, does have a chance to talk. Um, clearly, what I'm looking for is a process that, at the end, we can say is fair to all, that everyone does not always get everything that they want in a budget nor do I think they ever will. It's always give and take, um, but it, it needs to be fair. Um, and the goal, of course, is to come up with an outcome that can be supported by all, all of the select board and all of the uh, uh, budget committee, and hopefully a majority of the voters so that we passed in one, one vote. Um, is any other select board member want to have a select board remark other than yes. what I said? I would like us to just do introductions. I know that that's corny, sure. but an introduction of your name. And if you care to say something about yourself, by all means. But if you don't, I will not subject everybody. So to why don't we start here. with you and we'll go sure that thing. way. Um, I'm Heather Nelson. I'm a select board member and I am a speech therapist. I have three kids who go to school here and I live right up the hill. That's why I'm sweaty, because I walked here. <laughs> you walked downhill. I'll be sweatier on the way back up. You're right, Barry. It'll be cooler then. Both ways. Go ahead, Jen. I'm Jan Coolidge. I'm retired and lived here for over 20 years. I'm Trisha Welch. This is my second year on the Budget Committee and I'm the Justice of the Peace. And I've been here for seven years. And... Uh, I'm, I'm Bill Moore. Uh, I work for the town as deputy town manager, uh, recreation director, economic development. Um, I've got two wonderful daughters who are costing me a ton of money with their pursuits in college. Uh, just got back from a visit in Marist um, down on the Hudson, gorgeous, and only $66,000 a year. So I'm pretty excited. Oh, boy. Brian Gold, select board member. Last year of college for my daughter, so it might get easier after this. But <laughs> <laughs> it is expensive. I'm still looking down the barrel. <laughs> Ralphie here, select board member. I hope to retire quick. <laughs> <laughs> Start saving. <laughs> and I'm Barry Varian. Um, I'm the budget advisory committee for five years, I think. I've uh, been in town a long time. Um, I'm here because this is my town and I love it. Gabe McGuigan, I'm on the budget committee, my first year on the budget committee, but I have been uh, the, so, the uh, solid waste board representative for 15 years or something like that, I think closer to 16, since that's my son's age. <laughs> we moved here right when he was born, so it makes it easy to track. Um, I have two kids in the school system, a high schooler and a elementary school. Um, and my family is as active as we can be in the community. We love Brandon and we want to do everything we can to participate. Hi, my name is Karen Rose. I lived in Vermont and moved here when I was 14. 
lived in Vermont 52 years, lived in Brandon over over 40 of those years. I'm retired. I'm glad. <laughs> Hey, I'm Doug Bailey. I'm the select board chair. Um, been doing either select board or budget committee probably for the last 10 years, a um, number of them in either role. Um, been here for 40 years in Brandon. Never thought I would love a town as much as I do like this town. I'm Tim Giles. Um, I'm a select board member, and um, I've been in town nine years now. Select board member, this is my sixth year. I'm Seth Hopkins. I'm the town manager. Um, I, like Mr. Bailey, I came on the budget committee first and then the select board and then have been in the town manager spot. And my wife and I uh, have raised our family here and we're in our 20th year in Brent. Did you want to go to the audience or that's just <laughs> I mean, we're good. I, okay. Yeah, I think the board's probably fine. And I'm assuming, unless you guys just want. To be put on Anyone the feel the need to take take the air? We the out there. When when we do get the public comment, though, we do have to talk into a microphone that's somewhere so that it can be heard. Is that right? Yeah, so that it can be part of the permanent record. Oh. Okay, so now we are going to start. Um, what, what we're doing is we're uh, initially starting off with our police department. Um, it was my intent to do police second or third because I thought it would be really a longer and more difficult task, but it ended up being tonight because the chief will be on vacation during our next meeting. Um, the policing is to me you know, very important because uh, I know from last year, there are many different uh, opinions and uh, what people feel are, are needs for the police department. Um, currently the police department is one third of our total budget. So when you think of it that way, um, it's one third of our town budget that we vote on. So it's it's a big factor. Um, and that's my introduction. I've asked the chief to be with us and give us a Reader's Digest version of where the police department is right now, um, as far as the uh, number of people and what they're doing, and then we can move on to our discussion. So if you can, chief, that'd be great. And if he's very brief, it's my fault because I asked him to be brief so that we would have more time to talk. And actually, for your, I actually wrote it out so it would be brief. I can read right by it, go right down it. We'll definitely read the digest version. Although, on a quick side note, I've been saying that phrase to so many people lately, and I now I know how old I'm getting because 99% of the people that I say just give me a reader's digest version have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> saying that, so. Just make sure you're talking to the mic. So good evening. I'm Chief Kachajian. I'm the uh, Chief of Police of the Town of Bar uh, Excuse me, Town of Brandon Police Department. I began as Chief of uh, Police of Brandon back on January 11th of 2022 after having replaced retiring Long Chief uh, Christopher Brickell. When I came in as Chief, we were down three officers total for the department. We were in dire need of hiring. Uh, for numerous open positions for our agency. At the time, our office was working extended hours and nearing, if not already, a burnout from uh, all the regular shifts they've been working. Although the department was well run by the prior administration, modernization and updating of policies, procedures, equipment was sorely needed. Since that time, through good old fashioned elbow grease and with the help of a very young but professional and determined staff, Brandon Police Department has moved on to its next evolutionary stage as a law enforcement agency. Um, where we once had three officers plus the chief, we now have six full-time officers plus myself, which now fills out all of the open uh, allocated positions for our department. In this day and age, this is an aberration. We are probably one of only maybe one or two, possibly three in the entire state of Vermont that are actually full staffed right now. So that is actually a, an accomplishment for this community. And also recently, as of July 1st, uh, we have moved to 24-hour coverage of the town, whereas we were only doing anywhere from 16, possibly 18 a day. We are now on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So there are no officers on call. If you call 911 or call the business line, officers immediately respond and they don't have to come from home. Also, um, during the time I've been chief, we've uh, implemented several new programs. The canine program, which was, has turned out to be one of the most successful for our department uh, in this past year, and actually 
within the last three to four months, we've actually seized over $106,000 in illegal street drugs to include cocaine, heroin, and also fentanyl. We've implemented a traffic safety unit. We've implemented a drone unit to assist us with a variety of tasks, anything from accident reconstruction. If we have missing people, missing children, we can utilize that technology. And I believe personally as chief that technology is the way to go and it helps us do our job uh, much more efficiently. Um, trying to see if there's any other points I want to. We have actually seen an uptick in our uh, calls for service. Um, I went back about five years, um, even actually almost six now, prior to when I became chief, and slowly but surely, our numbers have been increasing. Um, in regards to that, though, our officers have become more proactive. We've actually, and I've just, I'll, I'll hold off on numbers just to keep it brief, but um, we've had an enormous uh reduction in traffic crashes for this community. I just learned from the state a few months back that through the efforts of our officers, uh, we've reduced our crashes by 29% for the town of Brandon. So a lot of that is just by doing motor vehicle stops. But on the flip side of that, we're not giving out a lot of monetary fines. We tend to err on the side of education rather than giving people tickets. We understand money's hard to come by for a lot of people. So if we can get out there, educate the public, slow people down, stop the crashes, um, that's our mission, and that it's actually been quite successful to communities. So I'm actually very proud that we've dropped the numbers down that much, especially last year with those two really bad fatal accidents that we had. That was very hard on the department and also probably the fire department as well as EMS having to deal with that. So again, just to keep this brief, some of the issues we're running into as of late have been the drug problem in Brandon, where not 100% sure of why it is increasing. One of the thoughts we have is that uh, down in Rutland City, between Rutland City PD, the Drug Task Force, Homeland Security, um, a lot of the agencies down there, they are being very proactive. And I believe that they're probably pushing that out of Rutland. And we're starting to see a lot of uh, spillover from that. And it's not just uh, drug dealers. The weight that we're getting in stops lately on car stops, and we've had something like 21 search warrants in the last several months, we're getting trafficking weight drugs around here. And again, the officers are trying to be really proactive with um, staying ahead of that. And actually, we just had two officers come back Friday from the DEA investigator school. We were able to get uh, funding for that. The federal government paid for it. And that's going to help them help us try to deal with the uh, drugs that are coming into the community. Um, that and a lot of other uh, extra trainings we've been trying to send everybody to our goal is to have a majority of our officers in an instructor capacity for our department so that we don't have to go outside necessarily and pay for all these classes. We can do a lot of our training in-house and try to keep the cost down as well, which I, I absolutely understand is a concern for this community. Um, so that's uh, in a nutshell what we've been up to with the police. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Are any of your officers trained to, to physically? What's the name of that? Oh, drug recognition expert. Thank you. Um, yeah. We have an officer right now who I have, I'm speaking with them probably tomorrow night. Um, the, uh, some people I've spoke with, with Governor Tyway are very interested in him becoming a drug recognition expert. He alone has had 21 DUI arrests. And actually, we're being told by uh, word on the street is, don't come to Brandon if you're going to drink and drive because you're going to probably get stopped by this officer. And we've gone from a ton of DUI arrests down to barely any. And it's because he's been extremely proactive. So um, he's interested in the program. And it's actually a good benefit for the department, too, because it's all grant funded. We don't have to pay for anything. If the officer has to come in to do, let's say, a car stop, and we believe they may be under the influence of drugs, the overtime is paid for through the federal government by state funding. And basically the only thing is it'd have to be available to other departments. But again, the federal government puts the bill for that, but it also helps us. Um, it's difficult to get uh, DUI drug cases or people who are under the influence off the streets. A DRE is a huge benefit for the department as well as everybody around us too. So that is definitely, um, I'm hoping this, this year actually we'll be able to get him into the class. Thank you. Yes. Chief. Um two things and and maybe they tie together you had said earlier that um we have 24 7 coverage at this point yes right which we could talk about a little bit because that's a great thing i think 
Um, it's a little bit of a surprise to me because I remember us talking last year about wanting to get to that point. So evidently, something has changed to allow us to do that. It got to the point where uh, we had to make a choice with what we were paying for. Well, we decided, <clears throat> excuse me, last year to, uh, or this, this year, to get rid of the take-home car program. So we don't do take-home cars anymore. We've reduced our fleet by two cars right now. They're actually in the process of getting sold. Um, so we're down to five total. So having the officers be on call, not having the take-home cars anymore, um, and being on call. So we're having to basically pay officers to sit at home to wait for a call to come in. And then when they got called out, they automatically got two hours of overtime and then that's just flat whether they were there for one second or five hours and then they got the overtime pay after that so uh, to me it didn't make any sense to be pay paying people to just be sitting at home getting paid at least if the officers came in um work the shift and we've changed our schedule a little we now our officers now work 12 hour shifts instead of the 10 that they were working before um we're actually getting a return on our investment and in that we have people here um while we're paying them, actually being out there proactive, shaking doors, checking local businesses, foot patrol, motor vehicle stops. And that was the second part of my question. With, with that change and having that increased coverage and then seeing the increase in, in drug awareness or, or stops or whatever, do those two tie together? Do we see more of that drug enforcement because we have the additional coverage? I think it's a, it's a combination of both. A lot of this stuff, I, I'll say this, the people who are dealing drugs were basically just doing it right open the open, right out in the open. We just didn't have anybody to sit there and see it. Uh, yeah, obviously, the question, officer, with the additional coverage, which is around the clock, and if, if this activity was going on without officer coverage, mm -hmm. we really weren't as aware of it. Yes, and, that's true. Right? We, we, matter so fact, having the additional true. coverage really has helped us in that vein. I believe it has, and if not for any other reason, and I was um, I was very happy with this statistic. Our overdoses have gone down. We we actually were seeing quite a lot of overdoses, and the other change too, and it's probably isn't common knowledge, but we've seen a switch from the type of drug that everybody's using before. Everybody was using heroin, and every single car stop, everybody were dealing with it was heroin. If they had an overdose, um, it would be because of heroin. Now everything is flip flop, and all we're seeing now is cocaine, crack, and fentanyl. Uh, every single time we get a drug stop, whether it's someone with a little bit um, on them or like recently we got almost a pound of cocaine, um, that was all laced with fentanyl. So it, it's definitely, um, we've seen a switch and I don't know if that's the cost, if it's at a federal level, local level, state level availability. I, I can't tell you why that's happening, but definitely the increase in coverage is opening our eyes to a lot of things that were going on that we had no idea. I mean, I'm sure as in every town and city and county and state, stuff goes on all the time that the police don't see at all, but it's, uh, it was much more prevalent than we thought it was. Thank you. Oh, yes. Um, thank you. You've answered a lot of my questions already, but I have two more. Um, have you noticed any difference in the number of domestic violence cases that your officers are responding to now than they were, say, a year or two ago? And I'm happy to say that we've actually, and I really don't want to jinx us, but um, I've actually seen a little bit of a, a reduction in domestic violence. We still get them. It, it's always going to happen. It's extremely difficult to do anything about that type of crime in general because it's just human nature. People get into disagreements. People drink, do drugs, have financial stresses, whatever it is. Uh, but I have actually seen a little bit of a drop in domestic violence, which is good. That's I mean, any, any reduction in crime is good, but that, especially that one. What would you say your biggest stressors are for you and the department? Is it people or money or you know, technology? What, what is it that you feel you really need at this point to help you? Me personally, I, um, and I, I, I'm just going to say it up front right now. I'm not even going to ask for it in this year's budget. Um, I do need a second in command, someone who, um, can do some of the administrative duties. Um, one of the things that I used to do a lot of, but I have not had a lot of time to do it, is I used to do a lot of grant writing. I, I can do them every now and then when I get a second, but as a, I'm what's called a working chief. So uh, some departments have a chief that just sits in his or her office and just does paperwork. Uh, uh, I actually go out on calls for service. I have to deal with administrative issues. Um, 
investigations, you name it, pretty much a jack of all trades. And there's a, a lot of time I could really use a second in command. But obviously, um, I looked at the budget and from this previous budget last year, and um, there's a few more priorities that I, I just need to have rather than um, ask for the additional officer. So that's one thing I'm, I'm not going to do, but I definitely could use an additional officer and capital improvements uh, in regards to police cruisers. Those are the big two things for my department this year, with the exception of there's a few things just for inflation and I need to increase like the phone bill and everything else for the department. And another thing that has come up this year uh, that hasn't in previous years, but um, years ago on the budget committee, we had to replace our body cameras. And there was a subscription fee, for lack of a better phrase, that we had to pay for it every year. You have to pay a certain amount on our body cameras, which are these right here. Um, and these have storage on them at a, a facility off-site. We have to pay for that storage, and that's 7000 a year and change. Um, it's very expensive, but that's just no matter what company you go with, they're extremely expensive. And uh, but what it saves us, uh, what it costs us in that to save save us in liability is huge, uh, especially when we're accused. If the officer is accused of excessive force, or if we have a crime, and I mean it just documents everything. But now that the subscription, we actually paid. I think there was some money left. Uh, it may have been. A, um, don't quote me on this, but there was a, a capital fund that was left. There was maybe $28,000. The town had paid up front for a lot of it. But by the time this budget cycle comes around towards the end of that, I'm going to have to start paying the subscription fee. So that's really the only quote unquote new thing I have to add into my budget. But other than that, I'm I'm just looking at trying to do minimal I can this year with it. Like I said, I just need cars right now. That's pretty much the biggest thing. Jane, go ahead. So do you think you have the equipment that you need? Like, do you have dr a drone to use? We do. We do have. Do have I, I was able to get some funding for two small drones. Um, very, They were very inexpensive. You can buy some really expensive ones, but ours are just basic, basic. Um, and technology-wise, there are things that we're starting to catch up on at the department that have just been deferred maintenance. Like recently, I had a little bit of a, a radio emergency I had to take care of. I basically had to replace a lot of the antennas of my cruisers. Uh, most of them were just snapped off at that point, just from wear and tear. Uh, I'm in the process of replacing a light bar on one of my cruisers because it's so old, it's bending in. So it looks like a V now. And if that ends up breaking and water gets in there, it'll damage the electrical system, which will be a whole lot more money. Um, and one thing I'm going to try to get grant funding for it is um, our AEDs are outdated. And actually, I believe I got an email the other day from trying to remember who it was, but I guess they're not even certified by the FDA. Is it the FDA, I believe, anymore? So I, I need to get some more defibrillators for the department. Right now we have two, but that's I'm going to try to find some grant funding for that. I was talking to some of your officers and they mentioned the radios that they're intermittent at times, certain areas. Yes, we've, uh, I want to say three weeks ago now, we had a company come in and basically do an overhaul of our system. There are still areas of Brandon in general that are just uh, atrocious. I don't know if it's geography or radio equipment. Uh, we did find out that the antenna on the top of the police department wasn't even a uh, actual public safety antenna was this, like a CB antenna. So I actually have um, I have one ordered right now for three hundred dollars to try to get us uh, some better coverage. But um, since they were able to replace a lot of the antennas on our cars, especially up towards Forest Tail, which is very sketchy at best, um, we've gotten a little bit ra better with radio reception, but we're still having some communications issues. So I have a question about the fleet. Yes, you say we're down to a fleet of five and you're in need of, of cruisers. So uh, do we have um, two cruisers you're thinking of retiring and you'd like to replace them? Yes, we actually have three that need to be retired, but obviously I, I'm not going to ask for three. I think that's too much of a burden for the taxpayers. I'm, I'm looking definitely to do two. And what I would like to do is not buy them straight out, but lease the cars and get us back into a, a cycle of being able to maybe lease two cars for three years. At the end of that three years, lease the next set of two cars, and that should put us on uh, back on track for capital improvements. But the, long, the 
longer we let this go, um, let's say we didn't just plain devil's advocate here, if we didn't get um, at least two new cruisers in this round and went another year, then our fourth cruiser is going to be closing on probably close to 100,000 miles at that point, because it's all three of our cars right now, I believe one of them is already over 100,000 miles and the other two are pretty much almost right there right now. And if by this time in July or even past that, we're going to be looking, if we don't get cars, we'll be looking at probably anywhere between 135 to 175,000 by the time the next fiscal rotation rolls around. So I'm just trying to get ahead of this before the cars get in such disrepair because we're also spending a fortune on cruiser maintenance. It's, it's insane how, mu how much it's costing us. But luckily, we have a good can uh, good mechanic who is keeping things running. But even a good mechanic after a while, you know, can only do so much. Thank you. Other immediate questions? Conversation I wanted to kind of spur us into was uh, knowing what we know about our police department. What is there about our police department at this time that we are we like we're comfortable with if there's any comments on anything like that i'm i'm very pleased with the conversation i just had with the chief because one one of the things i really wanted to see us work toward after leaving last year's session was to get to where we had that full coverage and it seems like through manipulation we were able to get there and then also I was encouraged by the increase in drug awareness because many, many years ago when there was a lot of back and forth around the size of the police department, do we need a police department? Can we use the state police and all that? The, the drug problem was the big driver for me that I always wanted to make sure we kept that barrier there um, to keep it at bay. And it sounds like with that addition of presence, we're probably doing a better job of that than we may have in the past. So I'm very pleased with that. So you like the idea of 24-hour coverage and drug protection? I do. So to speak. Okay. Anyone else? I do. I like the 24-7 coverage, but I realize not everybody can afford the higher taxes for it. But it gives me more comfort knowing that um, someone's there if you have to call. I, that's, that's kind of where I've landed as I've molded over. Um, is that I just when I think which which few hours would I want not covered, or like which accident are we not gonna handle? Which one's gonna have to wait an hour for state police instead of getting somebody right away? And I have trouble feeling okay knowing if we could try to swing it that we should try to swing it with the same note that Jan makes that, you know, if we can't afford it, we can't afford it. But um, as I think about it, that's that's sort of what comes to mind is that people are presumably calling the police because there's an emergency that they want help with right away. Um, yeah. Um, oh, regarding the nope. cars, I would love to see us get into a cycle of like, just what the cycle is whether it's two cars every two years or one car every year like whatever the cycle is i just would like it to be sort of nothing set in stone but to to have this be a plan that also that the police chief could count on because um it's tough to make good sound decisions if you're feeling like yikes you know i might not have this again i might have it again who knows that's hard to to deal with and might make i i mean i just i would worry that it would make me want to spend money quickly if i were in your shoes thinking like yikes if i don't get it again or like that type of situation so I don't know how realistic that is, but that's what comes to my mind. Let me just answer that real quick. We used to be in a plan where um, Jan and I are both aware of it, and I'm sure Seth is, where we used to set aside half a cruiser a year, buy a cruiser every second year in cash. Yeah. And, and that has been crubbed a number of years ago now, which kind of puts us where we are. So we do need to figure out where we go from there. Yeah, that's certainly 30,000. They were running two years ago around 76,000. 
I'll deck out. I, I actually have uh, everything else being relative, and as the fire chief could probably tell me when I um, when I started looking at the prices of cars, I almost fell out of my seat. And never mind for a civilian car, but how much police vehicles have gotten expensive, and we're trying to put minimal that we can. When I was looking for quotes for the cars, one of my our canine officer actually has been assisting me with trying to like find quotes for them, and uh, we're trying to see what do we need. And, and what can we sort of kind of not go with? Like we, we need cages, for instance, um, like even a push bumper for the front of the car. Some people might say, well, that looks aggressive or that might look intimidating on a car, but there's actually rhyme or reason for it. And a lot of the times, and I'll take the car that I'm driving tonight, it's like a 2014 Taurus. And from working at my previous department, we hit a raccoon or something with one one night and it broke the headlight. It was $700 to replace that headlight and the push bumper is not even that much. So any little bit of extra protection on the car, it's almost like an investment in just trying to keep that equipment safe. But um, just like any any police chief or sheriff or colonel, we all want all the bells and whistles, but even, even the basic equipment in a car, like a cage, a rifle rack, the lights, the sirens, um, a push bumper, and that's pretty much all we're just looking at right now for cars. Um, even that's gotten really, really expensive. So we're trying to, when we're doing our quotes, we're trying to pair the amount of how much stuff costs, but we're sort of kind of at the mercy of the police market. Hopefully maybe car prices will get cheaper, but it, it's that's, definitely that's expensive. Rich. That's one of the things that um, I hope comes out this year is that we do need a capital budget and that ties into it, that we really need to start thinking across the whole town and all the departments, really what are the things that we know are given and have to be replaced and planning for it so that it isn't a last minute thing or isn't, you know, when the prices are better, you're cleaning out. Um, so I'm glad to hear that you have a plan of what you think your department needs and that it's properly equipped to do the job as well. Um, and, and then just in general, I've just been really, really impressed with the police department that when there's been an issue, they're there, they respond, they're helpful. Um, so now if they're 24 hours, that's even better that I feel much more comfortable. I want to be looking proactively at doing the DRAs. Rain and Thumb has been a hard party in town ever since I've been on this place drinking and now we're all saying drinking and I, I want to thank you because it can save a lot of people and it can save a lot of parties with your proactive approach to looking at this and intervening. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Anyone, anyone else want to chime in? Yep, I have a few brief pieces coming out. Karen's comment. Um, you mentioned that you did um, when you did stops, you did a lot of education. You tried to give warnings as, instead of punitive. And I think that it sounds like rolls into the drug offensives. And if that's sort of the culture of your department, I can see the positive nature of that, getting out ahead of these issues um, and trending the community towards safety and com compliance is a word that I probably don't want to use, but towards the acting safely and appropriately within the realms of the community and caring for your neighbors and all of those things and being proactive in any way in the drug world. It's, it's a wild um, environment out there. And if we can educate and care for and contain that stuff, it's, it's a big help. So being out there ahead of it is, is great. And it sounds like you've got that culture across. Just officers. I I can, I can just say, like I said, I, I'm just the chief, but my officers um, are being very proactive and I can't praise them enough. I'm proud of them, um, what they're doing. A lot of times I don't need to be, tell them, go get drunk drivers off the road, go get drug offenders off the road. They're out there actively looking for them. So they, and I'm actually glad a lot of the officers have recently moved to Brent and they were able to find rentals and what have you. So they are taking an investment in this community. They they want this community to succeed. Um, th they want it to be a good place to live. And I'd say almost 99% of my department is not native Vermonters. They're from New York, Connecticut. I think I have one officer who's just moved down here from Franklin County, our newest officer, but um, they want to get invested in the community. They want to do what's right. They want to be proactive and um, they just want to uh, do a, the best job that they can. So I, I personally can't praise them enough. Yes. And thank you for that. And the 
the the drug problem it's it, it really hits humans it's it's a it's a social issue that hits real people and so it's important and glad you're really addressing it at people um my next my second component is about um uh, the grant writing stuff you mentioned grant writing a number of times it sounds like something you have experience in and it's something that i have experience in not personally writing them but being involved in departments and things where people do and the value of that is often greatly underappreciated and that the support that would go into allowing someone to do that grant writing such as yourself or bringing in an external grant writer um, the the cost when you when you analyze it in a budget committee or against a budget doesn't look good on paper but the the back end outcome is so astronomically beyond that expense people will look and say oh a full time grant rate is $120,000 a year oh my god the amount of cruisers that you will get the amount of support that you will get from will exponentially exceed that so i would encourage our group to consider that and i would encourage you to consider thinking about what maybe middle grounds that you could find without finding a full-time um, assistant that might allow you some of that time to write the grants because those grants will definitely pay off for additional cars or additional uh, resources like the like the camera system that you mentioned being a grant proposal and something to do with drones and things like that that technology pays off in spades and it's well worth finding the time i mean when i was at swanton village i was there for roughly three years and by, and I'm not patting myself on the back, but just because my chief and the village manager there gave me a lot of latitude, I was able to secure just shy of a million dollars worth of grant money. So, and we got everything from a boat to, um, I got three officers at one point for the town under the cops grant. Um, we worked a lot with Homeland Security doing Operation Stone Garden to do um, human trafficking enforcement up on the Canadian border. So um, I, I will say this, I did. I do do grant writing. It's not my favorite thing to do, but I, I definitely, like you were saying, I see the benefit of it. And and you can usually get equipment that um, you usually couldn't get just through a municipal, county, or state budget. So it's definitely, um, depending on what you need, it definitely is a huge help. A lot of these grants are, are out there. The, the, the grant providers, whether it's the federal government or how, wherever it's coming from, they want to give these things out. And there's often not enough people requesting those resources. And so I look forward to hearing more that you've been able to take advantage of that. I have a question. So, oh, you should go, Dorothy. Okay. So my question is around like the trick of um like I lump it into a like a helping professional. I don't know if that's really the word, but like the more hours you work, the more people you help. And I wonder um but also when it comes to like the data and the numbers, I'm wondering, are like if you compare hour to hour, mm. are you getting, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Like, like, is it that the needs of the community are going up or is it that, you know, things go up by 25% when you have 25% more coverage? Do you know what I'm trying to say? Like, yes, um, I think it's a combination of both because now that people know that we're on 24 hours, a lot of, <coughs> excuse me, a dry throat. Um, a lot of people just never called us till the morning. So the day shift would have to take the calls from the night before. So the day shift officers are just coming into calls. Um, and, and there are also times where, <coughs> excuse me, uh, where officers are being more proactive and they're discovering more crimes. Let's say um, if we didn't have an officer on the overnight shift and a lot of the guys have been doing foot patrol, if they're going out checking downtown businesses and they happen to find a door open at, let's say, 3.30 in the morning and they find out there was a burglary, we may not know about that till 8 a.m., 9 p.m. when the business owner comes in. And by finding that crime, especially there not being many people out and about that time of night, are we going to see somebody suspicious in the area and maybe stop that person, find out that they were the person who burglarized the the business. So I think it's an amalgam of both. Um, I don't think it's necessarily officers 
100% being more proactive that's causing the increase in yeah. calls for service because, and I'll just, um, I'm, I am I, know I, I promised Mr. Bailey, I wouldn't like go crazy with um, time consumption here, but um, I'm, I'm gonna, just going to do a quick stat. So last year, we had 253 crimes that were reported to um, the police department. This year, and this was just as of Friday, because I haven't been able to up the uh, incidents as of today, but we're at 260, and we still have three and a half, almost four months to go. Last year, for the whole year, we had 155 arrests. Now, uh, as of Friday, we're at 166 um, drug search warrants. Back in 2020, we had one. In 2021, we had one. 2022, we had one, 2023, we had three. Oh, thank you very much. Um, and this year we've had 25, I'm sorry, uh, 21. Um, drug incidents, 25, and that was back in 2020 when we had zero. Um, overdoses have been reduced by uh, almost 75%. We've had 21 DUI arrests um, so far this year. And like I said, we still have three and a half months left to go. Last year total for the whole year, we had 29. So um, a lot of these aren't necessarily incidents that um, officers are um, proactively creating. Some of the stuff like you mentioned about domestics, those we have no control over. Um, there's just some things that happen that people call us for traffic stops, crashes, like I mentioned earlier, those okay. fatals and stuff. We have no, that's just an act of God. Um, that makes sense. Versus like how many tickets you write, it's probably correlated with how many hours you work. Yes. And, and even then, we, the one thing is we haven't seen an insane amount of car stops on the overnight shift because there's just less, obviously less traffic. But the car stops that we are doing are end up being the people who were Get, getting for drug offenses and they don't even hide it anymore it's they literally leave the evidence right there in the car i mean they'll just leave it right on the dashboard and we end up at our canine right now has pretty much a hundred percent um success rate the only time he doesn't have a success rate is when there's actually no drugs in the car but every single car that he's hit on that he's been called in on has had drugs in it and he's actually one of i believe the only dog in the state of vermont that's imprinted on fentanyl there's no other canines that can um detect it in the state of vermont and we have one of them so um, he's also hitting on those cars that have the combination of drugs which again cocaine no, there's no such thing as a good drug but uh the more important thing is getting the stuff with fentanyl off the street because most people for the most part won't overdose from cocaine what have you but when other stuff is mixed in with it and we're also seeing starting to see some other types of drugs that are getting introduced synthetic drugs that are uh just as bad, if not worse, than uh, fentanyl. So it's good that Guinness is able to sniff that stuff out, for lack of a better phrase. So does anyone else up here at the table have anything that they want to mention that there is a, a, a like or happy that what's going on at this point? I would say one more. Go for it. Which is that we had an email from a resident that just thanked you for being, there was a death in the households, and the police had to take care of the family in the immediate aftermath, I understand. And this person a month later wrote an email just saying like, thank you for being um, a positive presence in a horrible time, kind of. Okay. So just that for the sake of what I'd say, lead, my leading the conversation, I don't want to use the word dislikes, but things that we feel might need improvement, or if there is something that's creating something that we're not. We forgot, Dorothy. Oh, I'm sorry. And in my particular opinion, the data you said the 24 7 coverage is relatively new. As of July 1st of this year. What I would be interested in how is that effective retention of staff? How is the stress level affected by the officers? Absolutely love the twenty the the new schedule, and a lot of it is because they get more downtime. The schedule is twelve hours on for four days, then you have four days off, then you work three days, then three days off. What was really killing the guys before is having to be on call because you just, and I, I, I was on call for many years when I was at Swanton Village and I didn't even get call out pay or anything. I just, I just went in and like on my own dime. So it's extremely stressful when you get called two or three times a night. And just when you, I always jokingly say to people, just when you crawl back into your footy pajamas and you want to go to sleep, um, you get called out again and you have to go back out and, you know, go to another call. So you're just, your quality of sleep is awful. Um, 
I've even seen it late, lately, especially because we've been really busy. I've actually had to talk to some of the guys and say, you look exhausted. You just need to back things down. You need to get some sleep. It, but um, as a whole, they're very, very happy with not having to be on call anymore. It's just, I, I think it's been a huge stress release on them. Interesting. Thank you. And the second question would be, again, probably too early to have data. Clearly, now that that new schedule, how many closures do you need? in order to supply that. Uh, so what I wanted to do, and I, I'm a big believer in redundancy because just like anything, things can break. <laughs> things are machines. These radios, my gun, my body camera, cars, everything breaks down. But um, just to save the mileage on the cars, I ended up um, having five cars total. We have a canine car that is the only one that's um, a take-home car and our, our candler lives in town. But a lot of times, and at the very least, it's for legal reasons. We have a certain amount of time we have to be able to get to a car stop. We can't extend the stop past past a certain point because then it becomes an unreasonable stop and stuff gets thrown out of court. So there's there's a there's reasons for having the take home car for that. But what we have right now is we have two cars on the day shift, which is usually uh, Monday to Friday at least. It's me and another officer. And on the night shift, we have two cars, and I I um, I assign those that way where. One car um, gets used for that 12 hour shift, then it sort of kind of quote unquote rests for 12 hours. And then we use the day shift car. So that way you don't have days where, um, and especially the newer cars, everybody wants to drive those. And if we did that, you're going to add a ton of mileage onto one car. And then you may have our oldest car that just sits there and never gets used. So I like to have uh, redundancy in that you have day shift cars, night shift cars, and it seems to be working with how we have the schedule out right now. Um, I'm actually right now I'm I'm content with the five it's working for us I don't um I you know maybe down the line if we ever one of the things I would like to revisit again as a school resource officer that may require an additional cruiser if we and, and I did meet with the superintendent recently the our new superintendent he seemed interested in um, moving forward with that. So we're going to have future discussions on that. But as it stands right now, I'm happy for our our capabilities to have the the four patrol cars plus the canine. It, it works for us right now. I don't think we need a ginormous fleet right now, but it depends on like what our requirements are down the line in the future. But I'm, I'm happy with what we have right now. Yes, okay. very quickly. How long does a cruiser last from the moment you get it to the moment that it should be cycled back out. Is that a five year, 10 year, two year? It all depends. Two years is too soon. Um, most police departments around the country, when I looked up the stats, I'd say most police departments keep their cars for five years or 100,000 miles. I've I read some places where they'll keep them for 50 and then get rid of them, but those are usually rich communities out in California. And I've seen some departments that keep them for a, an enormous amount of time, which is you're just asking for trouble until you have a catastrophic failure when you're using it to respond to an emergency and God forbid something really bad happens. Um, but the average right now is usually about 100,000 miles and or five years. And I'll use the example of Montpelier PD. When I was there, we got a new car every year. We had a fleet of five cars and every five years and or 100,000 miles, they would just keep rotating through. So nothing was used yeah, past that. That's kind of where I was leading to. It was with five cars. Okay, I want to ask Seth, because he might be able to answer the question. I know last year when we were talking cars, we were talking about some state police, or it's through the state of Vermont, some police car lease options. Those kind of things still available and round guess as to... I think we were at, were we at $28,000 a year for three years for one car? That's my record. Uh, tw um, and that, was that two years and then you owned it or three years? Three years. 28 a year. Three years and we had to give car. the car back or we get to keep it for the fourth year so it's really kind of like a loan but it's through the state um, it's they okay. call it a lease but it's not right. a lease. correct it's basically 20 um when we did it last year it might have to tweak up a little um just because the cost of everything's increasing but i believe it was originally twenty four thousand per car um in doing if we did two cars forty eight thousand over three years and the benefit of leasing is that once I think someone just mentioned it, the 
leasing company or the dealership would have you they'll pay for those repairs except for just like anybody's car tires brakes and windshield wiper solvent and then at the end of the three years you have the option do you get rid of those cars or do you keep those especially if they're in still good shape it makes sense to keep them i think uh, when I spoke with our bookkeeper, Jackie, before, she said that they have municipal leases where um, there's usually two options. You buy it out at the end of the lease for a dollar or the company just gives you the car at the end of the three years and you can either keep them or throw them back in and get new cars. And yeah. sir, these are complete duty ready. <clears throat> All those and what's the stat you need? Uh, no, I'm the majority of the stuff that we need. Like I said, I'm I'm looking at the budget. I'm trying to keep costs down, but at a minimum, we need we need the lighting. That's that's we can't get around that. Um, a cage, uh, a light control box, um, a radar, um, believe a single gun rack, and that's pretty much what we're looking for. One of the cars we do need to replace right now, and it has the most mileage in our fleet, is the canine vehicle. But it's basically the same setup, except instead of a prisoner. Uh, compartment it's a it's a cage for guinness and it does come with a fan but we would uh, those fans are a thousand dollars a piece we would just take it off our old car and just put that on to try to save some money so anything we can cannibalize and that's what we've been doing with our cars lately is um, the two cars that we gave back or are, are trying to sell right now we've been actually taking parts off those and putting them on the new cars just to save some cash thank you and and for budget committee members sorry to interrupt bill more um that is like what you're dealing with when we're talking about doing any purchasing uh, for a municipality, as soon as they say it's municipality, we can charge a thousand dollars for a dog fan. You know, that's the kind, that's the level. Of, every time we make these purchases, I just understand and thinking about that when we're creating budgets that like you might be able to go to Home Depot and buy that thing for this. But if we're going to one of our places, like um, unless we're going to Home Depot, we're going to these municipal places that charge a premium because we are a municipality. What's the oldest vehicle we have? How many years and or miles? Uh, the highest mileage one is our canine car, and I believe that's a 2018. It has uh, over 100,000 miles right now. The car that I'm driving is a 2014, I believe, or 13 or 14. And then we have a 2016, which, like I said, they're just almost at 100,000 right now. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I was asking for if anyone had any um, things that they feel need improvement that they can think of as far as policing. Right. I I have a desire that we, um, in some capacity, I don't know who, um, develop a written capital plan for the big, the big expenses that are fixed things that you like will always need. You will always need body cams probably forevermore. You will always need uniforms. You will always need cars. Like those are things that like bare minimum we can count on. Yeah. I would love to have um, a capital plan for the more expensive things and for replacement, but also just, I mean, I suppose that is the budget, but, but the most, I, I would really love a written line item. Yeah. Line item. I, I was going to suggest that the chief, chief work with the town manager to, you know, prepare kind of what things he feels should be on the capital plan and, you know, where we would get that started so that um, we get back not just cars, but things that we have to have. But not the ammunition that's in every year by and that kind yeah, of yeah. I so, gave some examples. Yeah, you know. So, yeah. I I think that's something that between our conversational meeting and then the next meeting that we have regarding police, which will probably be a month from now or so, numbers will start to get assigned to things, and then we can it, it uh, we can move towards you know what are needs, what are wants, what are you know what do we kind of have to do. Um, Yes. I do a lot of driving all over Vermont, including our city, and I tend to shuttle people who are, I would call, more beautiful, vulnerable, um, people who work second and third shift at odd hours, and um, not just to you and your staff, but also to the town. It makes a difference when the town cares about people coming safely from A to B. 
And it's not just a police to make that happen, but that the community who cares for each other better. So thank you. Does does the uh, shift rotate? In other words, is the same guy on nights all the time, or is, is he nights for a time frame and then he moves to daytime? Or what we're doing right now, and it's just to break up the monotony, because sometimes one person will get sort of kind of stuck on weekends for a while. So what uh, we're trying to do is every three months or so, and we're so new into this new schedule that we're still we haven't even reached that point yet. But um, my plan is to make sure that everybody gets rate rotated quarterly. That way, I like I we used to call it pigeonholing people, so you're stuck on that one shift, and that also has a lot to do with um, you know officer happiness and morale too, because no one wants to be. And I, I don't believe having worked midnight shifts for 20, 20 years straight, where I didn't see the light of day for a while on my thing, I know how awful it is to always be on that shift and to be able to have that option. But another thing we do uh, for morale for the officers is, and I, I've told them. Um, do it amongst yourselves as long as you can figure it out. It makes everybody happy as um, they've all talked amongst themselves for the most part. And uh, like I'll, I'll use the example. One of our officers is girlfriend is a teacher and she has certain set days during the week that she works. So he actually likes to work certain days to coincide with her schedule. And if it makes everybody happy and but we still get the end result where, you know, the morale is good and everybody's happy and everybody's healthy, then I, I let them sort of run with that. But like I said, if I had somebody came to me and said, Chief, I just can't do midnights anymore, or I'm sick of being on day shift, I want to go where it's more exciting on the night shifts, I try to keep it flexible for morale. Does our union contract call for shift differential? Okay. So it's a dollar an hour more for each hour worked between four in the afternoon and I think six or eight in the morning. Okay. Other questions, comments, discussion? Well, certainly before we go on, are, are you preparing to go to the next? Uh, yeah, well, if there's no more discussion with the police department, I would like to move on, but I, I know there's gotta be more. Well, um, I, um, I I often try to frame um, policing, um, especially during budget making time, with this idea of um, levels of service. Um, and I've I've made the analogy to insurance, which I think is a another um, sense of security that people grapple with. There's um, there's the concept except of minimum insurance, and many of us are okay with that. There are concepts of more insurance for people that want to feel more secure about what they're insuring. And then certainly for people that have the money, there's a concept of kind of extreme insurance where you insure something to the point where it's almost like a maintenance plan. Um, and I, I think you're all you know, familiar with the idea. And um, when I think about policing and I think about the state of Vermont and um, different places I've lived, um, I, I sometimes um, ponder this idea of um, a level of service that many people in Vermont live with, which is less than what we have, and it would um, be less of a burden on our taxes and less of a burden on, a, on just the cost of maintaining a service. And then I think about the level of service that we become used to, um, which um, in my time on the board, it's, as I say, this is my sixth year, um, has been steadily... Um, you know, growing. Um, I mean, congratulations for getting a, a fully staffed department because it's the first time during my time um, um, on the board that I've seen that. But it's um, it's produced an upward pressure on um, um, on the size of the department and what we do and how much it costs. And um, and I know there's been talk uh, as I am laying this out, and I'll try to be brief. I don't want to too long you know you have a, a minimum level of service you have the level of service we've become used to and then you have a concept of enhanced service which we've explored uh, briefly last year when we talked about having a regional police force kind of concept where we might fund part of our police department by serving um, peripheral communities which would allow us to to, um, um, to spread the cost you know and so when i think about budget making i would love to have that um, framework exists somehow where um, 
we could consider um, the cost, the, 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 the costs and benefits um, of, of having a smaller department, you know, what things we would be giving up in service and which, what savings we'd be achieving, um, the costs and benefits of staying where we are and the costs and benefits of, um, of getting bigger. Um, um, and, and so, so I figured tonight would be a great night to introduce that idea again, which is what I did last year. And um, my second piece of this is um, now on a larger time frame, which is, um, you know, I'm 65. I've, I've been around during the war on drugs. Um, my feeling is, is that the war on drugs um, mostly doesn't work as a philosophy, um, that um, the war on drugs criminalized a lot of people and put a lot of people in jail, and we still have a huge drug problem. Um, this is this is not to say that I think you know drug dealers should just walk around dealing drugs. I, I'm not promoting drug use in any way, but um, when I think about the drug problem, I see it as a supply and demand, and the war on drugs is going after the supply, and I'm not convinced that going after the supply diminishes our drug problem because I feel like. Um, my life experience is that when people want drugs, they're going to find them. And, um, and that what we really need to do if we want to address the war on drugs is to try to go after the demand problem, which is, um, is, is trying to understand um, how to uh, drive demand down. Um, and that's a bigger, more difficult problem, which is one of the reasons why we, <laughs> we don't do this everywhere, right? Because um, I'm not suggesting this is an easy thing, and I'm actually not also not suggesting that it's a police officer thing, because it's kind of like social work, and it's kind of like um, mental health, and it's kind of like um, the stresses of daily living, and how do we reduce that so people don't turn to drugs? Um, it, it's it's a whole. Uh, I would argue it's a public health problem, um, but I, I sometimes worry that um, that. that the tendency is to reach towards having more policing. And, and that's what I'm going to try to represent in our conversations in these meetings. And it, it, can I just build on? Please, I, I'm I, I, I actually, I agree with you. I, I think that you're, you're not going to arrest your way out of the drug problem. It's multifaceted. Um, there needs to be treatment. There needs to be mental health. There needs to be a bunch of different, um, you know, ways of approaching it. Uh, from, from law enforcement's Point of view. I mean, we do try to facilitate that where we can. And a lot of what happens with um, the drug issue, when it happens, like you said, you it, it has side effects. If you have people coming in and there's always going to, like you said, there's always going to be demand for drugs. But one, why make it easier for them to come to Brandon to get the drugs? And a lot of times when drug dealers come into town, um, just look at Lester. Was it last year where we had that shooting from the person? I would have stayed there that they had that fatal up there at the trailer park. A lot of it brings quality of life issues. If you have, and I'll just use an example, not to continue this on, but um, let's say you have somebody who lives in Brandon, a drug dealer comes in and they're like, okay, it's going to cost a hundred dollars for the co cocaine. Well, I don't, I don't have a hundred dollars. And they're like, well, I'll be back in an hour. And next thing you know, we're getting car breaks up on West Seminary because they're trying to steal stuff out of the cars or you have property crimes or, Let's say you have people who um, stiff their drug dealers, and then those people come back looking for their money, and they do bad things, uh, whether it's assaulting or worse. Mm -hmm. So I, I do agree with you, and don't get me wrong, I, I absolutely 100% agree with you. It's a multifaceted approach that we need to take, and we do work with our mental health services and where we can, our counseling services. And I also agree with you that um, it is on another level outside of Brandon. I wish we could, I wish, wish, wish we could get more money for mental health services. It's, it's, I don't know of a, a cop on this planet that doesn't wish we had more mental health services because at the end of the day, even drug use or alcoholism or whatever your um, mental health issue might be, a lot of times that comes back to having a strong mental health system in there to help us. And a lot of times we're caught in the middle of it and we literally don't have any resources to help these people. And the last thing we need is to put them in jail. Um, but a lot of times, unfortunately, that's just the reality of it. But um, I, I absolutely, Mr. Giles, I, I agree with you 100% that you're not going to rest your way out of it. But I also don't want to make things easier for people to 
come to Brent and to get drugs. And as awful as it sounds, if they have to go someplace else, like Rutland or whatever, I'd rather see that and not have those corollary damages that we may have from that, like I said, uh, crime or overdoses <laughs> even, because then that becomes, like you said, a public health issue, because then we're taxing our EMS services, our fire and first responders. I've, I've seen different modalities where, let's say a police officer, certain factions want them to be everything to everybody. They want them to be a treatment provider. They want them to be a, they want them to be a social worker. They want them to, to, to be a liaison or a free court um, intermediary. That would be like saying, okay, now you're going to do recreation, or now recreation is going to do policing. You guys have a specific, in my opinion, you guys have a specific job to do, which is to do the law and make sure that the community is safe. But I don't believe that you can be everything to everyone. And I don't think that that should be expected. Okay. The, the the reality of it though is that um that that is what the police are these days and i don't i i don't know the answer to this whether it's societal or just um at the end of the day and, and I'll, I'll ask everybody here in this room if you had a problem that you, you you had i don't know care what it is whether it's criminal justice medical psychiatric if you had a family member that was going through something and you didn't know who to call from my experience, 99.9% .9 of the time, and I've had some people call me with some doozies, but like, I don't even know why you would call the police, but they literally will turn to the police because they don't know who else to turn to. And we don't necessarily even have the services, but I've learned over the years that sometimes, um, and I don't know why this is, people feel comfortable just sitting down with a police officer and just talking with us. And again, goes back to your thing. Sometimes it's not all law enforcement. Sometimes people don't know who to turn to and they look to us for that. We're not trained psychologists, sociologists. If I was, I'd probably be a lot richer, but um, I'm, I'm just not. But um, that's what society expects of us. Um, and like I said, sometimes it's just a sympathetic air to listen to people, but that that is the reality of what we do. It doesn't say when we go into the police academy that, you know, you're going to deal with robbers, you're going to deal with sexual assaults, you're going to do counseling. It's that, that, but that's what we get stuck doing a lot of times. And I've actually had um, mental health services and counseling services say, it's not our problem. You deal with it. I've literally had them say that. And it's very disheartening to us because we're like, well, aren't you supposed to be the people who are trained to do this? And then that puts the burden on us. And then we have to try to figure out how to fix this problem. I mean, that's that's basically what police are. It's not really law enforcement anymore. It's not public safety. We're problem solvers. That's what our job is. It, it truly is. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I can't make this up. It's literally what our job is now. It's It's gone so far from left field from when I first became a police officer back in 30 something years ago at this point from I thought I was going to be getting criminals and tickets and everything else it's gone so far away from that but uh, that's what society expects of us and that's what until there's some better system that's what we're going to continue to do because we're not going to just someone comes to us for help we're not going to say in our problem you can go deal with it some people are desperate and they want that help and we'll do what we can for them we're not going to solve society's issues but um I, you know a lot of times people don't have anywhere else to turn to that's a great segue into my my question is i was leading towards a question to that uh with the 24-hour coverage we only started on july 1 so we really have july and august so far um, what do you feel um, might be the pitfalls of 24-hour coverage that you may have uncovered so far that you need to try to get, grab your hands around, and how do you see it? Absolutely. It's, and I'm, I'm not I'm a person who believes in being straightforward about this. We ran into an issue with the overtime, and luckily, um, we were able to catch it. Um, with the problem was it's a contractual issue that we – figured out uh, from the last contract with the police department union and where we had estimated that there was only going to be some built in overtime just for the nature of the shift. Because what happens is um, we have officers working a 48 hour shift their first week. And then the second week they're working 36. So initially when we looked at this plan, the four hours from that first week was supposed to revert over 
to the second to make up that deficit. What happened was, um, and again, it's something we're actively looking into right now, both the town and the and the union, the town manager, um, about tweaking that because that is, and like, again, I won't sugarcoat it. That's unsustainable. We cannot, um, and I know Mr. Giles and I went around about this a little uh, while back, but um, that is not sustainable. And I agree with him 100%. It's, it's not, you can't do that. But where just like anything else, there's growing pains with it. And everybody at the PD, even the union, you know, they're, they're willing to try to make this work and we'll tweak it how we have to, but it's, uh, it's growing pains and they can be painful, but we're in actively trying to rectify the situation right now so that we're not hemorrhaging overtime because that's like i said as an administrator i don't like seeing that that's not that's not a good thing but um we're like i said we're looking into this and we're going to try to fix this asap so that is one of the pitfalls of what we've run into um other than that like i said um the officer's morale is much better i think it's had more positives than any negatives uh, involved with it so i am happy how it's going but again um we should give it a an evaluation period to see how this is going to go and down the line um who knows i mean like i said i i see benefits to this rather than negatives but the overtime thing mr bailey has absolutely been a a bad thing we're, we're trying to fix that right now though right. to try to hopefully get nip this in the bud and um be able to get on track where we stay within our budget for the year that's like my main mission right now so thank you i want to ask Seth, is it can can we or should we even mention the conversation that we had that would be maybe splitting some of the financing of the department or that it's just for um, you know as tim has mentioned you know the the you're going to bring that up Yes, it was. And I, yeah, I'm going to let for the, the people in attendance, and even I don't think the chief has heard this yet, but uh, we had a conversation um, that may have led to a, a new and interesting approach. And that's what these meetings are, is to discuss a lot of approaches. Um, <laughs> I can clearly say that I, I am a person who... Uh, feels that we passed a budget last year with a lot of angst and a lot of uh, grief and i don't want to go through that again um i want to you know work through this so it goes the best in the smoothest way that it can go but also when we come to the conversation of policing last year we passed a budget i believe is around eight hundred and sixty five thousand dollars the, the bottom line it started out at nine hundred thousand which would be in the book, but then we took out cars in the charging station and something. So 865-ish is the magic number. For the new people on the budget committee, every 30,000 is 1% in our budget. So when you hear people talking about a 1% increase, probably 30, $32,000 creates a 1% increase. Um, I personally, personally, Doug Bailey, taxpayer, not Doug Bailey, select board chair, uh, I'm I'm fine with whatever the the public wants to have in policing, and I think that that becomes a very difficult issue. Is what is the public want? We we hear <coughs> conversations in ourselves in small groups or whatever, and I don't know. Last year we did put a question out there about the 24-hour coverage or whatever, and it ended up and it was a non-binding. You know, do you want 24-hour coverage or whatever? It came down just about 50-50 was very, very close. But at our last Lakewood meeting, we had a, a, another interesting conversation about how it would go. And Heather actually kind of came up with a lot of the ideas, so I'm going to let her float it, and then I'll so, kind of chime in. Yeah. Um, so I said this thinking I am going to be laughed right out of this room, and I'll have to take my third pee break of the night to so my cheeks aren't red. Um, but... What I had what I had wondered about was, is there a way to get input from voters on what Tim was referring to the level of service? Because there's such good arguments on either side of how much policing to do. On the one hand, you can compare to other towns and what are they getting? And on the other hand, you can compare to like which call do you want to miss? And it's a real toss up. 
like, I, and I mean that truly, like, I'm not trying to say one's obviously worse and I'm not trying to give bad arguments for one or the other. Um, what I was wondering was, is there a way to pass, and this was truly a question, is there a way that we can have like a base police, like could police somehow be separated out from the the other portions of the budget so that folks can vote on, do we want this budget that would cover on-call services and kind of what we were used to a few years back, or do we want this other option that has 24 hour coverage? Because it, it's such a, it's such a divided issue. And I don't know like the legalese of how it would work, but I think that this is one example of a time where as I sit here on this budget committee, I think, man, I wish there were not just 10 of us. I wish there were 4,000 of us. Doug, may I? Yeah, go ahead. One point that maybe I need clarity on. You mentioned that we had put that non-binding question out there. Chief is telling me we have 24-hour coverage that was arranged through rearranging of existing uh, budget allowances. But yet we don't really have information. You said that was like a 50-50 response i don't think it really was i think it was more it was 55 45 okay with a lot of people in favor of it but nonetheless the question that was posed was do you want to have 24 hour on on duty coverage at the cost of an additional like eight they, they didn't say anything about cost at, at an additional expense right it, we did it, it didn't say cost in the in the we um, did tim it did it said, we would did. you want 20 So any no coverage? vote would be opposed to the cost. It would, the it would be in the book. I'll find it. So a no, my point is a no vote could very likely be opposed to the additional cost. Yet we have it with no additional cost. So when you say we have data around what people want, we really don't. We have data around an answer to a question that was posed to people that now isn't the existing condition. Okay. Uh, we, we don't have it with no additional costs. That's what been being worked on this year. There's a lot of overcuts yeah. at an extreme cost that needs to be yeah. settled. What we were trying to solve in the budget last year was to be able to remove on call and whatever expenses was not really helping us get additional coverage. And um, this was in the rework of the budget, and, and the budget committee was involved in it. Um, because that, that doesn't work. And what has happened, and it can still be a, a bookkeeping error, can be part of the contract with the union, we don't know. But what has happened in two months is more than the entire year's worth of overtime that was budgeted has been used up in two months. So that's not sustainable. So we got 24-hour coverage, but what's happening is the increased coverage is creating increased crime, stop, stoppage, not increased crime, but, you know, the arrest, which is creating increased paperwork, increased court cases. Which is overtime. Which is overtime. And so the overtime is gone. And if it continues at its current pace, we we could probably be, by my, my quick math, we, we could be looking at over $150,000 of overtime that was planned to be about $19,000 for the year. So, so what we really don't have yet is we haven't worked out the kinks, which the, the chief has said he's working on, and I'm more than willing. I, I do not want to micromanage the police department in any way. I am not a policeman, but I know that we cannot be $150,000 over budget. So regardless, and not have the people scream at us. So regardless then of any, any sentiment that was shared from the community, what we have right now cannot continue is what you're saying unless so, we can solve so have conversations around what we have right now and what the benefits it brings us and all that it isn't a reality so here's, here's it's a reality what, if you want to pay for it well it, okay but the impression i got is that was op, that was happening within our operating budget well but it the, sounds the, like it's not the question actually said you know do you want to um uh i can read it for you 
It said, um, advisory information question for select board guidance. The town of Brandon's police force is currently able to provide 24-hour coverage through reliance on overtime and an on-call system. In order to provide full 24-hour coverage, the town would incur additional expense in hiring officers to fill that schedule. Should the select board consider adding an additional police officer, open parentheses, plural, to increase coverage to 24-hour on-duty on coverage? And it, it was voted 55 to 45. Okay, but that isn't the path we went down. It is so the path we went it's down. It's not the path we went down. No, no we, I think the path we went down was kind of maintaining, but trying to get away from maintaining, the over. Maintaining personnel as is. Well, right? we added expenses, which is part of what we're grappling with The question with was now. to add personnel. And, and that was budget, voted no. Not the current budget, the one that we're working on now. So, so let's just hear this concept. Sure. Let me just give you a real base of the concept. And the concept would need to be massaged. And this is the first meeting, and we're just talking about it. But when I first heard it, I thought, man, it doesn't, doesn't sound like it would work. And then I thought, well, maybe it can work, because here's a way we can do both. We, we can't. So the idea was to maybe have an appropriation of some of the police expenses. So we, using Tim's word that he said a little while ago, and I don't think he knew I was going to do this, but there's a minimum police department. The current police department, which is 865, and then um, enhancement. And I had a conversation with the chief in his office recently and said, you know, I could see us having a million three hundred thousand dollar police. If we told him we have a million three hundred thousand, can you spend it? I'm sure he would say, yes. Oh, absolutely. They, you know, they can do it. But what if, you know, because we can't put make the put the police department totally on an appropriation because it's the appropriation loss. We would have to disband the entire police department. But there is a possibility of doing something where we say our current police department has seven men, six men and one six men. chief or whatever, and is is doing this for a budget of six hundred and eighty thousand, and that's what we write into the budget, and then have an appropriation saying the police department would like to add whatever, 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 whatever at a cost of two hundred thousand additional. And see, and truly give it into the hands of the voter with dollars and cents and everything. Yeah. It's an idea. I, it, it's a great idea. At least it's a it's an idea. But, but I, I guess we're on where we're at. We gotta we, what I'm starting to understand of where we're at is really a very short term trial of something that really doesn't look like it's working. And we're really back to where we were before of Close. saying well, close to where we were before, saying that you know this isn't a plan that can go forward. So if we want to have this coverage going forward, we need to ask for more finance, more money. Right. right. I, I don't consider this to be a short-term um, plan. The, the, the town manager has put this into force. The chief has got full schedules and going. And well, I, no, the words I keep hearing is it's not sustainable. There's nothing suggesting that this is going to change anytime soon. But so, it's, I'm hearing it's not sustainable. That means it's not going to. Well, and that's part of what this budget talked about. But we have a fiscal year that runs till June, and um, and, we, and we can't be one to two hundred thousand dollars. Oh no, no, of course not. Yes, Trish. Well, I'm hearing two different things. One is that it's more of a scheduling thing that you have a lot of hours in one week and then less hours in another week, and that that's what's causing a lot of overtime. So, so what, what's happening is since we work twelve-hour schedules, the first uh, offices are on four days on. They work 48 hours. They have four days on. Then our pay period is a two-week period. The pay period. Second week on, they work three days on, which is 36 hours. Then they have three days off. So in our two-week pay period, they're they're in that deficit of four hours for the third the second week. They're only working 36. Yeah. But the week prior, they're working 48. Okay. So our plan initially in using Hollow pay and on call um, specials pay, like part timers pay. And then what we had for just our regular overtime budget was to take that four hours, roll it into that week where it was only 36 hours. So that makes that whole. So it's the second week of 40 yeah. hours. So instead of getting eight hours of uh, pay period, the officers were only going to get four built in overtime. And that was also going to be uh, basically making up for their on-call pay, call-out pay, and we're actually going to get a, a benefit of it. But what happened was um, per the union contract, I'm trying to remember if I have a copy of it, but they get paid at 40 hours overtime. And so once we hit that 40 hours in the 48, 
then it became they they have to get paid for the 48 and that's why we right. went into double to double what we had thought if we had caught that earlier we we would have figured out what was going on the only way i caught it actually was by looking at a paper because uh, we've been using a new system to do payroll electronically and mm -hmm. i happened to see a payroll sheet that i was actually able to flag that on and i realized that's exactly what's going on that's why we're into so much overtime but isn't that more a uh, scheduling or a bookkeeping well so, from my standpoint from my standpoint that's scheduling and and management which comes down to the town manager and the police chief and not the select i mean the select board is there to set a budget and whatever but I'm the last person to tell the chief what hours he should work a man, you know, so. It's like a union agreement. And, and the union's involved. Yeah. Just a second point to the suggestion, and I'm certainly open to listening to lots of ideas, but I think when you start breaking up the budget with special appropriations, we're back to what happened with the pay and, and all the uproar about that is you're pulling these things out and saying, oh, special, but then people aren't really commuting, com computing that it's still what they're going to pay their taxes on. It's still going to increase it. So I would rather spend the time working on figuring out the schedule so it isn't so out of whack from week to week than it is to suddenly say, okay, well, let's pull plowing out and let's pull paving out and let's pull, you know, wastewater out or whatever it is and have all these special appropriations. So just saying, this is what the budget is. Is that scheduling problem resolvable? I don't believe so. I believe that the union contract says what it says, but I also believe that labor law is that you pay overtime on a seven-day week. I don't believe we can negotiate with the union to pay overtime on a 14-day pay period instead of a seven-day week. And scheduling-wise, is, is the schedule situation resolvable so we wouldn't be in that boat? I'm not sure whether the chief and the officers can come to something that would make that work or not because of it's the nature of the number of hours in the day, the number of days in the week. And, and that that's all I'm really getting back to in my mind is the conversation of is this short term or long term or sustainable? Sure. And to me, when I hear not sustainable, problem not resolvable, it sounds like this is a short-term situation, and we will be very quickly back to where we were of not having 24-7 coverage and right. looking for permission to do so. Well, right? I, I wonder if, I'm I've, sorry, go ahead. I have one thing that I would just want to add is that part of the reason why you're not getting a direct answer is that one of the people we need to do the like figuring it out with is on vacation. So when you're getting sort of a if it felt like somebody was dodging, like no, not that at all, Heather. I just it was just that no, no, my, somebody on vacation and I don't feel that at all. Yeah. I feel that with what I'm hearing, which is very, very definitive answers, I don't feel as though this situation will continue for us as a solution into the future, and that we'll be back to where we were last year, looking for a solution and permission to fund it. Okay. Great points. Is it fair to say that to achieve the 24 hour service, this was a solution that you were able to work out? And now that we're ironing it out, we're seeing some of the issues with it. And there's this, uh, this uh, loophole with, with overtime laws that is coming into effect that we're sorting out now. If we can't sort that out, which it sounds like that's the case, it sounds to me like Right, right now we're robbing Peter to pay Paul, and maybe that's fine. Maybe there's there's fewer cats rescued from trees than there would be otherwise. But we're getting we're 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 putting the twenty four hour stuff to the test. And is it fair to say that you currently don't have the the officer power to cover with another schedule? We. We have exactly, and when I say exactly, exactly yeah. enough to deal with this. And I do have experience with this. Again, when I worked at Montpelier, um, we were on a, I'll use example, we were on 24 hours a day. We had 10-hour um, schedules, 10 on, 10 off. We had overlaps. Um, we had a sweet spot for officers. If you had too little, you couldn't maintain it. If you had too many, 
it was literally too many. It would it would just the, the schedule wouldn't work right. But I want to say we had 17 officers, and that was the sweet spot, and that's what made it yeah. work. And it didn't incur any overtime. We had enough officers to cover all the ships. And like I said, our attempt was to do it with what we had available to us. And yeah. um, I I actually did some research on it too, and looking um, even ironically enough on on defund the police website, and it says what the optimal. Um, optimal staffing for a community as per capita, even the Department of Justice, um, the FBI, and for what we have for a population right now, I think it's 4,000 and change, I'd have to check, but uh, it says we should have 9.2 officers to adequately police this town. Um, we're trying to do it with what we have available to us. And like I said, uh, that's just what the powers that be said. Some are a smidge below that. Um, some are way over, which I don't even agree with the numbers that they're saying. But uh, the majority of it is right around that area. So, um, do I do we have enough to be able to yeah, police this town? It's difficult with what the, we have. The robbing Peter to pay Paul thing is a great step to take, and I'm glad you did it. And we're going through and, and putting this stuff to the exercise. But Tim wants Tim wants to reply. Or yeah, um, no. Did you finish that though? Oh, I was saying we're, you're working with 48 in a in a world of 40s. Yep. Your your numbers are just sort of fighting each other through no no one's fault. It's just numbers on paper are fighting each other. We're just trying as a That's department a chat and a whole. We're just trying to give the community the best bang for their buck for police protection. We're just trying to do what we can with what we have. And yeah. like I said, maybe that you know, at the end of the day, if this experiment doesn't work, it doesn't it doesn't work. I I hope it does because like I said, I think this is definitely beneficial for the community. But again, everything has you know, like a period, an evaluation period, we have to see if it's going to work. I think with this, I, where I'm, where I'm headed with this is, is as we go through this experiment, we'll see how much the overtime costs. We'll see, we'll see real numbers, real data. And like I mentioned with the, the bang for the buck with, with getting grant availability, someone able to write grants and things like that pays off on the back end. I would be interesting to see as we go through these exercises, how an additional officer compares to the additional overtime and if that brings us back into the metric of 40 versus 48 while maintaining 24 hour coverage, does one additional officer fall under the overtime number and do all of these pieces fit together? So thank you. Yeah. Well, what I wanted to um, respond to, which is very much in the vein of what you're talking about, is, um, is Trisha's comment um, and, and your observation that. Um, you know what we need to do is solve the scheduling, um, and and I think what you miss in that is that there's actually a difference of opinions about how large the police department should be, even within the board, and certainly within our community. And the benefit of this approach that um, Heather, um, you know, came upon last time, and I I talked with her more about, is that it would give the community a, a more robust. Um, especially if we do our job well, it will give them a more robust choice of saying you can either have this for this much money or you can have this for this much money. And it wouldn't be, um, um, it wouldn't be fuzzy. It wouldn't be like, you know, just more and we'll get everything we want kind of thing. It would be like specific. And, and I, I think that would empower the community. It would give them a, an ability to say, yes, we actually want 24 seven policing with the right amount of staff and with the right amount of cars and we're willing to pay for it. Or what we found last year with the budget was that there's a lot of people that want our budget to be smaller mm -hmm. and they might say, well, gosh, Pittsburgh gets by with a chief and two subs. And, you know, there's other communities that get by with, you know, three police officers, four police officers. Maybe we'd like to consider going to that. Mm -hmm. And, and I know that in the past, this group has been, um, wonderfully supportive of our police and, and and i'm supportive of our police i just want to support police department um and, and so that what comes out of this budget process is often let's go for the 24 7 let's you know get um that full level of policing and then let's find a way you know to pay for it and and i just want to give the community the option the uh, to vote to to want a smaller police department and i I'm, i apologize no no please. i think i'm in the same vein that um Good, good thoughts, good thoughts for sure. Um, I think I was going to say this later on, not when we were talking about police, because it's more of a broader yep. feeling. Last year's budget development process was fine. 
But once the budget didn't pass, everything that followed that had a completely different focus. I mean, the budget development process was this team or, or various members in a team putting together what we felt was a service level, perhaps in, in de by department, that we felt the town should have in, in our eyes and our views, with our experiences and our, and our feelings. What happened after the budget didn't pass had no consideration for any of that whatsoever. It was really affordability. And I totally respect people that are in the crunch and their and their primary focus is affordability. I've been there, you know, in my younger day. And affordability was the only consideration. And any of the positives or any of the continuous improvement or any of the things that I'm hearing talked about today, or, and maybe even a a joint mindset this team will come to over many sessions down the road, we're out of the conversation. We have to fix that somehow with whatever we come up with here over the next few months where the community really understands we're putting forth a budget to service level as you speak where maybe some department service level is coming up and other department service levels are going down. There's, there's adjustments being made, but it's really providing a comprehensive service level to the town. Um, I don't think we understand that right now with respect to the police department. And my feeling was that when we're done here, there needs to be some pretty cohesive PR effort to try and get the town and the community back on the page of understanding, we're here trying to do the good for the good, you know, and, and, we're, and we don't want to find ourselves in a position of cutting things just for the sake of affordability. That, that whole promotion has to kind of go out there where people understand that. I don't feel comfortable at this point suggesting we hire personnel for the police department, increase the size of the police department or any of that, because I don't really have a good feeling of what, what the community wants for that. But I think by department, service level, we'll have to try and figure that out so that what we provide or what we put forth, we, as a unified group, feel is in the best interest of the tenant. I, I very much like the idea that everyone's talking about that levels of service. This is a great approach, good, better, best, all those things. Um, a component of that, like you mentioned, um, where you put it out as an alternate line of, of voting. Um, as, and, and you mentioned it in a, someone who's presented with this question is going to think about it very deliberately and think about how it compares to Pittsburgh does it with this many, Middlebury does it with that many, the, all of those components. My, my concern is that I, I feel that a lot of the voters that are out there are not going about making the decisions on those sidebar mm -hmm. items um, as thoughtfully as they, they should. And that's where Mr. Varian's, um, how do you get that information out there effectively, is that a lot of those voters are more money, less money, less money. And that's the extent of their, their process. And, and as budgets and as the social environment that we're in are heightened, like this last round, I think the society as a whole was sort of. And, and yet our appropriations always pass. Yeah, right. There's never it's, been an appropriation. Great. And I well, which, which it completely countermands right. your, your point, though, because when is, they, aren't, they aren't seeing more money. No, they're actually saying, sure, do that. Oh, I like that one. Oh, I like that one, too. And so when it goes to appropriations, those pass. Then why then why go appropriation at all? Why why not just consider it here at this? It, it certainly years? favors the people that yeah. want the appropriation to pass because it, it seems, so. I, I I bring that concern. I wonder how many of these people bring it to the table to real quickly. While well, Suge is Well, I, look, I I think people don't always understand that appropriation is effective taxes. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And yet we do say that on every single appropriation. We yeah, that it, it is the word. I, 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 I have done a lot of work on that, but I don't think people understand that. So they say, oh, I don't see So I'm not sure, you know, so yeah. there is a bit of a disconnect there, I think. Um, 
But when you were talking yeah. about like presenting a couple of budgets, and I'm thinking way outside the box, but I actually went to Montpelier a couple of years ago to fight as a clerk against ranked choice voting, which was floating around the, the state house then, because I knew it was a tremendous amount of work and that my election people, we would be there till three o'clock in the morning doing this ranked choice voting. But maybe we should be the one town that says, hey, here's three budgets. You rank, you rank, rank them, and we could do one line item as a ranked choice vote. I'm just throwing that out there. Very one final thing, and I'll, I'll stop taking all the time. Um, it might be a way, as you know, pass or fail, as an indicator, perhaps of of going forward. Maybe the second year. I think you got to work it into the budget. Right, right. But the other thing that I would say, and and Chief, you'll have to help me with this. I remember three, four, five years ago when we were bringing on new officers all the time and they were staying and leaving and staying and leaving there there was a long period of time through um the the training that they go through where they were not available to us mm -hmm. right if it's an appropriation and and it's only a one year funded appropriation you could lose six months of that person's ability to serve and then they're gone legally i, I am going to come to neil legally just so Someone new here, um, if anything is an appropriation, that is the only thing that that money can be spent on. That's why I always did personally like it to be used for the paving, because we would identify the roads that would be paved, and that's what would get paved. It couldn't end up being anybody's salary or anything else. I know you got your hand by uh, yep. Neil, or, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, and I'm not going to show the next thing you just got a microphone. <laughs> Um, I think that the idea of putting different concepts of police coverage as appropriations is doable, but I think you need to include the other side of it, which is if we give you a $10,000 budget, it's going to be a three-hour response time if you call in the middle of the night. If we give you a $15,000 appropriation, it's going to be an hour and a half. And, and, and turn it into something that's real that people can measure and see, well, you know, if I need a police officer here, I don't really don't want to wait until the sun comes up. Karen. And, and have it both, both consideration. Yep. Karen, your turn. So you mentioned that the morale was up and people were on schedule. <clears throat> Things seem to be working a lot for you right now. <clears throat> what is the cost of sending a new employee to the academy? I know it used to be very, very expensive. We are if they graduate. We actually, as a no community in the state of Vermont, pays directly for an officer to go to the academy. Okay. There is the state basically foots the bill for it. If and they give a certain amount of, let's say, an academy class these days, average let's say forty people. So the state pays for forty officers from state police, Windsor County Sheriff Brandon, whoever goes in there, and they pay for that. The only thing we pay for is their. Uh, their academy uniforms, basic equipment, raincoats, gun belts, what have you. But the actual tuition and them staying there and the food that they eat at the academy when they're there Monday through Friday mm -hmm. is paid for the state of Vermont. Okay, I wasn't sure. We're, we're paying their salary, the town, we're paying their salaries, exactly. even though they're not on duty. Okay. Correct. And, and then when they come out of the academy, if, they're on probation for a while and they're working with another officer. So there are costs from the town, but not from the academy. No, the, the, the state pays for their academy yeah. training. Sure. We've been talking about trying to get on a capital budget so that we kind of can know when things are happening, we can plan for them, and and it's a little less it is up and down. Yep. And so I guess, as you were saying, with using an appropriation, again, it's like, okay, we're going to have the money this year to do this, but next year it's going to go away. And so we're going to then fire an officer because now we don't have the money to pay for them, and then we're going to go look for another one, and then we're going to do another appropriation. So again, it'll be up and down. Yep, so um, in response to that and, and Heather's idea, I, I do, I really believe, who can correct me, but I believe every ballot question in the mind has to be a yes or no question. I don't um, think you can offer I don't three think options. Know that for you, might, you, probably, you might know more. That part, I think that part's correct, but I could be wrong. I don't know. The part that I think I want to offer in relation to Heather's initial suggestion, which has been modified to put some in the budget and do some as an article 
and Trisha's very good question about stability. I think that if you go that route, it will be really necessary to put either in the question or to make extremely clear during the public interaction before the voting that this is the year where we're going to make this decision. And after this year, it's going into the budget yes. if you say yes. Yes. Or if you don't say yes, we're going to take some time off. But I, I think we need to at least maybe we can't bind a future select board or a future town meeting, you know, the, the voters. You can't tell the voters um, you're going to always say yes on this question. But I think you could say this is a multi-year commitment. And after this public input, it's going into the budget. And and to be clear, when I brought this up as an idea, I don't think I envisioned it as an appropriation, which is a one-time thing, um, which is why when I said the legalese is... Yeah, and I wanted to check it out tonight just so you'd all have a chance to think about it. That I thought was worth... I'm really happy we talked about it, quite honestly. Because we're, it's, it's, you know, these meetings as I am seeing them are for us to talk about all different possibilities and shake out what might work, might not work, or might be, I mean, because I could see someone saying, well, now you're just deceiving us by putting it as an appropriation. So, I, you know, I want I want time to have it because I want the, the group to be able to feel good about our, what our end product is and be able to all work together to sell the budget. And if we if we can't, then then we're in trouble again. Oh. Uh, Agreed. Any other? We we only have 13 minutes left. I did promise that the meeting would end promptly before nine or at nine and not go over. So we're probably going to hold off on, unless you would like Sue to talk and not you and Bill. We could, we could do that. And then I think it might be a worthwhile use of time to set some dates together. With yes. Same well, that's on my closing. Well, wait, does your 13 minutes include the closing? Well, no, but we're going to we're going to let Sue talk. But I'm going to just give you something to also think about. In my closing, is I clearly have no preference whether we have the meetings on Monday nights or whatever night. I also have no personal preference if we have a meeting from seven to nine, like this one was, or six to eight is better, or whatever. So think about that while Sue's talking, and then we can um, decide on future times. And I don't have anything for Karen. I'm happy to stand up here and <laughs> <That's all you're... laughs> can finally sit down. <laughs> um, thanks, Chief. Oh, thank you, Yeah, thank you. That was good. He, I, I met. He's a hard act to follow. <laughs> the only thing I really came to say tonight was suggesting what you already are there is that we should really look at. I think I don't get involved too much of the budgeting, as you all know, but I really think we should have a capital budget, whether it goes into the budget or not i mean people need to understand that when we put money away to buy things later it's going to increase your taxes i mean i we had i heard it a lot when we were running through all the budget stuff of you guys don't plan ahead you got to put your money away yes well that's tax money that we have to tax and then put into those funds but i think a capital budget is a good thing to have i think it needs to be over five years i i got a bunch of stuff on it recently i just went to a training and um i have some ideas i also think at least internally that we should do a five-year budget that we should be looking at i think this board should be looking five de five years down the road all the time um and that's that's it that's all i have to offer thank you and i'm also way past my bedtime so <laughs> <laughs> unless you have questions but I think we're all on the same page with most of that. So, all right, let's think about we we do have a meeting scheduled for two weeks from today. Which what is that date? I don't even 30th. the thirtieth. And I can't make that thirtieth. Tim cannot make. Dan cannot make. Dan could it zoom. You could zoom. I think we're going to have it. I'll be if, out of state. So, so I I mean I chuck out. It's kind of hard to to schedule around twelve people or so, but um, I don't care if they're Monday nights or Tuesday nights or, I mean, if someone has a night they can't do. Monday nights, I'll be selfish and say Monday nights are super way easier for me Yep. in terms of not missing kids stuff. Okay. I just get here at the tail end of dinner. Um, 
Yeah, it's all bad to say it's not earlier than seven. Which may so not not earlier than seven. You couldn't do six. Today worked well. You know, I'm fine if it goes past nine. You know, if we're in the middle of something and we need to finish it, if if it goes to nine twenty, I mean, okay. if we're here, I'd rather finish that department that we're working on than to oh, it's nine. We have to stop. Yep. You know, haven't I shared my my board chair rule that no good decisions are made after nine p.m. <laughs> um, I'm holding the the forget. I I I appreciate what you're saying, but I think. The, the nine came up many times throughout the night and kept us on track. And I think mm -hmm. treating that as a hard deadline. And if we have to, yeah, if you're well, right near the end of it, wrapping yeah, something I mean, up, it's worth it. Hard time with the, with the next one. I, I would make a suggestion that we just plan on Monday nights at seven until we get to okay. what we need to. And then everybody can just. And they would be on the time. opposite nights that are not our select board. So, Seth, can you tell you the next two after the. Over 7th, 21st. 7th and 21. And then, like, hopefully we'll be done by Thanksgiving. Uh, well, we'll we can have turkey right here. Yeah. Yeah. I might have a conference on the 7th. Thanksgiving. That There's there. not many. Then. So again, the original plan is to have these yeah. conversational yeah. meetings, yeah. then have, like, the chief will meet with Seth and iron out numbers before the next time he comes back that we can then talk about and then we can can look at it I, I am very conscious of the terms that came up so many times last year after the first budget fails um, from the public was the, the uh, you know deciding on the the needs not the wants and you know wanting to make sure that we continue to um, to, to stick within that also I hope you notice we don't have a cl clerk here tonight uh, because we pay for a clerk each time the clerk is here to take notes and make minutes. So I hope you're all making little minutes of your own because I did not see the need. We never had them in the past. And then last year we did start paying $150 a night for the clerk. So I'm trying to be very, very uh, conscious of it. Um, this is meant to, to stimulate some conversation. So the next one... Um, we're going to do highway. Yeah. And I guess we'll get into town management. Community development and town management. If we can get all all three of those yep. done, we, we yep. will try. Doug, I think this is a good format. I, I appreciate you coming up with this approach. I do. Um, I think as we go on through, you know, several more meetings, maybe the picture will clear up a little bit around, you know, what things are, what people's minds are starting to think the budget should look like. Um, I really believe that we need to share that more in a more in a progressive way than at the end. Um, I don't want I don't want people to feel as though last year's they got the taste of no, and now we're going to be there again. I I really want people to feel as though we're doing the right thing for the right reasons, and kind of have them ease into that. Versus here's the budget at the final. At the final state, my own preference is that we take our time. We're starting on October fifteenth versus November fifteenth. Um, I don't want to go through what we went through last year again. Personally, that's my my goal, and that we can all feel that we have a, a good finished product. And whether, however many meetings it takes for us to get to the point that we're comfortable with that is what it takes. So. Seth, will this be on the, um, the agenda thing? Will that be on the website so that we know ahead of time like which department is being oh, yeah. worked on all that in the day? Any other comments before we break up tonight? I just have one thing that I didn't ask any other select board members about, but sometimes I've done like the posters and I've taken some notes for the group. I thought I thought of asking you to do that, but I, people like it or not. I'm not. It doesn't even have to be me doing it. Maybe there's somebody else who's just got that. I mean, if, you, uh, but yeah. if if that's something that people like, to me, I was like, I kind of missed that tonight. I liked, the yeah, when like, yeah, when we could all like see, and you can see that your idea was up there, and then we 
Because when we did that before, it helped because we went back through. Well, as a visual, I mean, like as somebody who's been to a lot of community meetings and do a lot of community development, you know, like it's it it's used because it works. It, you, you know, you know whether it's you know that, the idea of going to your your college class and taking notes and then committing it to memory, you know, because you're writing it down, not necessarily because you'd heard it the first time. The idea of putting it on a whiteboard for people to see as you're speaking those things helps lend some gravitas to the. And your especially words. when we're talking about okay. numbers and stuff, yeah. sometimes it's easier just to put the number up and join up. I am more than happy to do it unless there's somebody better suited. Can we ask Seth maybe to try to work with the chief just a little bit towards a um, capital, you know, what items maybe should be on the capital and look at um, municipal leases that are possible for, for just, even if you can look at some of that and shoot it out to the um this group by our interoffice mail in it within a couple of weeks. And that I think you all got Seth's message. Some of you are new to this, but it, when I send out an email, um, you can respond to me that you got the message and you're coming or whatever, but make sure you don't go respond off because that gets to be a communication that um, we're making decisions outside of a meeting, which is in violation of the open meeting law. So um, feel free to email me, call me, anything that you need, but just so that. Yeah, new new members know that. Any other housekeeping? I want to thank you all for coming and spending such a nice evening, weather-wise, outside and being in here instead of doing something else. And I want to thank the people up here for for coming and feel free to uh, email any person on this budget committee or any of us uh, as selectmen. I, about housekeeping, I do know the sound up here is challenging, and I expect that by the next Monday, the select board will be able to meet in the main meeting room. The, the floor is uh, not quite cured yet, the uh, paint, and then the next budget committee on the 30th should be in the regular meeting room. So the light will be better, the sound will be better. I think it'll be a less challenging environment. Looks real nice. They just painted the floor. We had to let it cure. You need a motion to adjourn. Oh, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Oh, that's right. I'll second. Wait a minute. We have four Follow. minutes left. <laughs> second to your All in favor, say aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.